to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, here at uh, Deep Adventure Ministries, we believe that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. When you abandon yourself to God's will, get in for a wild ride. Uh, God is wild. Just look at just look at the cosmos. Look at the 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 uh, quasars and the black holes and, and the wilderness. Even here in America, all created by God. Uh, for a beautiful end, and you and you as well. But God wants to set you free. G.K. Chesterton said that the orthodoxy of the church, I'm not quoting him word for word, is basically there uh, so that good things can run wild. He also said that the church, the Catholic church is the only thing that's bigger once you get on the inside than from the outside. People on the outside look at it as a bunch of rules and dogmas and and all this, but actually the these things, that the, the things, the moral teaching and the the doctrine of the church is meant to set you free. So because you're meant for a purpose, and we know how to get you there. We know, we know how to get you to the point of finding uh, fulfillment uh, for here on, her, here on earth, living a life of beatitude, a life of virtue, and also uh, to be uh, at a point where you will see uh, God uh, in the beatific vision, vision. And we want to invite you, men, uh, to join Bear's Man Cave uh, you can go to you have to go to our website deepadventure.com and sign up there <clears throat> but then we give you access to our private uh, secret Facebook group the, the man cave and then men there really challenge and encourage each other and and mobilize each other we just had a, a, a one of our dear friends Bob Kamer who is a ma- member of the man cave and really went deep with the Lord uh, partially because of the man cave and the men there and he just left. Uh, he just left planet Earth about um, about a week ago today, I believe it was, and is as, and is in heaven right now. He is he is he is seeing God face to face right now. Uh, also, I want to remind you guys, Jesus said that um, uh, broad is the path that leads to destruction, uh, narrow is the path that leads to life, and few there be that 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 uh, walk therein. And so I've got a, uh, my guest today, Mike Aquilina. I've challenged him. <laughs> to bring us some real grit uh, and bring us some real meat and uh, discuss what it means to be a man in light of uh, some of the early church fathers. And there's no more, more, more manly than a man like Mike Aquilina who is dealing with kidney stones this summer. Now that's <laughs> manliness and that's courage and that's fortitude. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, I let the cat out of the bag there. But So how, how is, the, uh, how is the, the, great, uh, the great battle going with kidney stones this summer? Oh, fine. I've been I've been uh, pain free for more than a week now, so I really can't complain. Oh, uh, the difference between severe pain and no pain is uh, rather huge, <laughs> and uh, I know they're still in there because I've seen them. Uh, with those those special pictures that they take. Do you uh, name them? Inside. Do they all have names? Have you named them? <laughs> no, I don't name them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid of what I might do. Oh my gosh! But uh, but yeah, they uh, they're in there. But we'll check them again in a few weeks to see if they're uh, they're causing any problems or any damage or anything like that. So uh, no pain. There's nothing more manly than a man dealing with kidney stones. Hey, Mike, I got a bone to pick with you. You went and saw your good friend Dion, who you you write lyrics for some of his his new songs, and you didn't let me know, and I didn't get invited to go. <laughs> And I'm kind of feeling kind of weepy, kind of teary-eyed now this morning about all that. I love Dion. I do too. I do too. I took my in-laws to see him. Ugh. They used to listen to his music when they were when they were kids. So you so like your in-laws long- better than you like me? <laughs> you know what? Uh, we use his one of his songs. Mike got got permission from Dion for us to use one of his songs on our very last episode. It's just so cool. Um, uh, Ride with you, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's got the sound of motorcycles revving at the beginning of the song, so it's just so cool. So uh, we're he gonna, did that. Yeah, go ahead. He did that at the show. Uh, with the, mo- the sound of the motorcycle. He didn't. He didn't use the sound of the motorcycle. But yeah, he did the song. And I just love. I just love Dion. I, really, honestly, he's the first singer I think I remember as a child. And I just remember. I think it was "I'm a Wanderer" or 
Run Around Sue, or I think maybe that's the same song. I forget. But uh, I just love Dion. Love him, love him, love him. And what a, what a privilege to get to use his music on our TV show. Hey, by the way, Mike, our TV show is up on iTunes. Nice. Uh, it's, on, nice. it's on Prime Video. Long Ride Home is up on Prime Video and Google Play and iTunes right now. So this is a chance for people to say, I love your show. I wish my nephew or my brother-in-law or my, my, uh, <clears throat> my son would watch this. Uh, give, send, go to iTunes and send them the link, and now they can power watch it. I'll, uh, as someone who had never seen the show before, I, I flipped on episode one, and I guess they didn't stop till they had all ten episodes done. And we're working on that, but we're, we got so had to we had to go back and re remaster so much stuff to make it. You know, it worked good on EW10 and the Armed Forces Network, but for iTunes, we had to really ramp it up digitally, and so it took us almost a half a year to redo what we did. Wow. And uh, but now we're 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 deep into editing season two, and we're gonna go shoot shoot season three, uh, in Hawaii. It's gonna be horrible. Why? <laughs> gonna go to my home turf. Uh, we're really gonna <clears throat> really gonna get to ride uh, in my home. It's gonna be beautiful, and we're gonna go to uh, to Molokai, where my dad was a deacon, uh, and go visit, go in the footsteps of Saint Damien. So it should be cool. Nice. So nice. I got a question for you right now. I'm, I am really excited uh, that things have been revealed, uh, what's been going on in the church. Uh, and uh, there's just kind of this draining of the swamp, so to speak, uh, in, in, with uh, what's been going on. And I just want to know, I know you've got, uh, you have a beautiful perspective uh, uh, on this. I wonder what, what, if you want to address that, what it means to be a man and what, what what we need what our response should be as the laity to what's going yeah. on well i mean our response should always be to look inside and and to see what needs to change inside us uh not to worry so much about what what we what we think we see in others you know because we're always seeing through the lens of the media and what they want us to see okay and that's kind of skewed often so um you know i i you know the only thing that worries me bear is that people tend to get very angry and 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 it's a righteous anger but they want to grab a pitchfork and a torch and they want to go looking for other people you know i think we have to turn inward at this time and see what's wrong with me start to clean house and start to live purity especially because these these scandals that we're talking about now they begin with small sins against purity and they proceed to ever larger ones until it's out of control you know, these these are addictions that take hold of people's lives and they ruin people's lives, not only the life of the person who's experiencing the temptation, the addiction, but also the lives of everyone around them. Uh, you know, the shame that 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 this brings on a family, the shame that it brings on victims. It's it's a it's a terrible thing. Satan's on a full on attack uh, against oh, yeah. manliness. Uh, you know, I was talking to my, my wife about this the other day. <clears throat> And she said, do you get now why God's raised up your ministry? Because you're challenging men to be men. And being a man doesn't mean to be macho. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she loves it. When she, the other day I was uh, having my prayer time. I don't know, you know, I kind of have those throughout the day. And I was reading my book on the, one of my early church father's books, which, you know, I love too. Uh, and, yeah. I, and when you read their writings, you, there's a moment where your heart just soars to the Lord and you have to lift your hand. You have to kind of lean back in your chair a little bit and just say, th and just drift away to the Lord and spend time with the Lord. And she opens the when she saw I was done, she opened the the the, the sliding glass door to the lanai and said, "Are you praying?" She was so happy to see me in prayer, and yeah. um, and the other day we had a, a situation come up, and I, I think it's just so cool. I I was concerned about something, and I said, I yeah I yelled to her across <clears throat> to the to the kitchen. I was in the living room, honey, can we pray a rosary for such and such a person, um, right now? And within five seconds, that person called me. So there's something about uh, about the dignity of the human person who's given a role to be to be like a prince in the kingdom, you know, to to have that that uh, not not the ruling authority, but to have the the participation as a son would, you know, to 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 um, to to make things happen. And so I, I agree with you. I think right now, though, the the, the attack on manliness, uh, pornography being such a great attack. It's like it's on the it's on the offensive. What what men who are dealing with that, uh, you know, not that you're an expert in the area, but you're a man of conversion and, and you and you and you know so many men, of course, who love the Lord. What would you what would your prescription be for for people that are struggling in that area, for example? 
You know, I think mo most people who've come through this and, uh, and, and who've come to the other side say that it, it was devotion to the Blessed Virgin that brought them there. Mm -hmm. You know, she represents purity in an amazing way. And she wants to share that, that purity, that power, that grace with us. And she will mediate it for us. Um, so begin by cultivating, um, uh, cultivating a devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Uh, take advantage of the sacrament of confession because you speak that sin aloud and, and you weaken it. You weaken it just by speaking it aloud. And then the priest pronounces those words of absolution and he weakens it further by pronouncing those words and gives you healing, divine healing, with the touch of Jesus Christ in that sacrament. Jesus instituted the sacrament for that purpose. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, regular use of the sacrament of confession. You know, go once a week. That's what you need. Go more. I remember once I went need. every day for a while. <laughs> I had a problem hey. with uh, someone that I was angry with, even though I wasn't overtly angry. I just, you know, I had to go every day, but it, it cured it. You know? More power yeah. to you. You know, the other thing is go to weekday mass, not just on Sunday. Go to weekday masses. Yeah. You know, I, I had the same thing. You know, anger I was dealing with, and I found that by going every day to mass and putting those people I was angry with on the altar at the offertory, mm -hmm. that it took the edge off my anger a little bit every day. And over the course of a year, I could see that I no longer had this rage against mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually had a kind of love for them mm. because I was associating them with the mass mm -hmm. and, and, and Christ heals us in that way. And so this whole thing that's the drain, the swamp thing that's going on within the Catholic church right now, which I think is, Praise God, the Holy Spirit is just like exposed at all, you know. Um, that whether the, the pornography issue is whether you're, you know, men who have same sex attraction, you know, the Catholic Church doesn't call them gay, doesn't call them homosexual, calls them people that have a disordered desire for other men, or whether you're a heterosexual man. If you've got an issue with pornography, this is the moment it stops. Now, I don't mean that necessarily you're going to overcome it completely right now, but this is the moment you go to your priest, you go. Um, to uh, to uh, and, and get help uh, for that for that um, for that challenge. I think the King's Men have a, have a program that they work with uh, Mark Hauk. But this is the day you get the help that you need, and this is the day you you know if 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 you're a man with that that challenge, I, I think an hour a day in prayer helps. I think it. I think that's the key. I know Cindy and I when we tandem surf. Um, when I put her in a, in a lift, you know, an extreme lift over my head when I'm surfing, there's certain places her eyes are supposed to focus. And, you know, the word sin comes from an archery term, both in the uh, Hebrew and in the Greek. It comes from an archery term that means to miss the mark. And you tend to aim where you're looking. You know, I was just at the firing range last week with a buddy of mine. You kind of <laughs> you kind of hit the mark that you're looking at. If Cindy, I, I when I, a really good... A, a tandem surfer can feel when, when his tandem partner's eyes just look from left to right or up or down. Uh, the, the, disp the, the way they're, they're, the ba their balance changes, even when you're on yeah. an extreme you know, wave, you can feel it. And I remember we were surfing in a competition, and I could feel something happening to her, and I said, look up. And the minute she did that, the lift corrected, and we finished the ride. So the thing is, is look up. Keep your focus on the Lord and, and, and ask God to bring you a conversion of your heart. And you can overcome, you know, this type of challenge in your life. We've been talking with Mike Aquilina, and we're going to get into it. Uh, we're going to get into a discussion about the early church fathers and the man, the manliest of the of the of some of the men that come to his mind. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak adventure. Mike, aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak adventure. I'm an adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and today. We have with us one of the men, manliest men I know, Mike Aquilina. He fights the good fight, and he is a, 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 a man who loves the early church fathers, and, and he knows I love them too. Uh, and, Mike, you know I got that set of books you recommended I get, right? I don't know. It's like 29 volumes or something, right? Yeah, it's great. It goes through the scriptures verse by verse, line by line, and it gives the commentary of the fathers on each and every verse of the Bible. So it's a it's a great thing. You learn how the primitive church, how the ancient church was reading the Holy Bible. And they have such a beautiful way of expressing it too. You know, I, yeah. I, so I, I read through the, the volume on the book of Acts because I'm studying the life yeah. of St. Paul. And now I've read through the first two letters uh, that he wrote 
First and Second Thessalonians. I'm about to start First Corinthians, and oh, I just feel like I found my my. Uh, uh, you know, it's just so sweet. It's just so beautiful, yeah. and and you know, yeah. my heart just soars in prayer when I when I read some of the writings. Uh, so, Mike, we we I so. I wanted to tell, we, we talked about, what should we talk about today? Because I have Mike on all the time just because I really love talking to him. Um, and I said, you know, Mike Aquilina, one of the manliest men in the world, according to him, because uh, he just dealt with kidney stones. Uh, what, what, you know, the first church father that comes to my mind is the John Wayne of the early church fathers. When St. Nicholas punched, punched out Arius. So let's start there and then we'll go on, we'll go, we'll take it, take uh, the path that you want to go. But talk, talk to me about John Wayne, St. Nicholas, St. <laughs> John Wayne Nicholas, or however you want to say it. I want, I want to say that as much as I want to believe that that story is historically true, I have my doubts. We don't have any instance of it. Really? We uh, don't? Of, of not, none from the ancient times. The earliest is from about 1,000, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it has the ring of a legend about it. Uh, and, and, <laughs> but still, you know, I think, I think the point is, the point is well taken. Uh, when we look at the way the early councils were conducted, you know, sometimes we imagine them to be like corporate meetings where everyone is genteel and we all follow Robert's rules of order. And uh, that was not the case. They could be wild, raucous affairs, you know, and, and at, at Nicaea, they pro it probably was. We don't know as much about Nicaea as we do about some of the others. But if you if you think about it, you know, at the Council of Chalcedon, one of the bishops was beaten by his brother bishops, and he was beaten so badly that he died from the injuries. Yes. You know, if we look at the Council of Ephesus, it was a wild time. If you re if, when you read the story, it reads like something out of one of the novels by William Faulkner. It was a uh, it was just a wild uh it was just a wild I incident in history. So, so yeah, you know, th there there is the possibility that there was violence at the Council of Nicaea, but there's no contemporary evidence. Well, that you know, there when was. you talk about too, that too, I mean, you, how in the world did we get through uh, when Arianism almost took over the church? But the Holy Spirit, this is his, his, his church, you know, and and he <laughs> is working always diligently to. We have always have hope, no matter what the situation is, who the Pope is, or what the circumstances are. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the church, the Catholic Church will, will will be, you know, will will uh, thrive and survive. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm looking over your shoulder, Bear, and I see that icon of Saint Athanasius. Okay, and Athanasius was the bishop who kind of seized the situation and acted like a father to the family of the church. When St. Jerome describes what happened during the Arian crisis, he says, the world awoke to find itself Arian. The world awoke to find itself Arian. You know, that means that Arianism kind of took over suddenly, maybe in a way like the way impurity took over our culture. Uh, we bear some of the fault of that because we let it happen by letting our guard down in our own lives, but also for our families. Uh, what 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 God used to uh, to restore the church was authentic masculinity. We refer to these heroes as fathers of the church. Mm. Why is that? Mm. Because they acted like fathers. Mm. In the pagan world, what was a father? A father was mostly a progenitor. Why were you married? Why were you? Uh, you know, siring children in order to carry your family name forward to the next generation. A father was simply a progenitor. There was not so much of an emphasis on the marriage relationship. Christianity made something different out of fatherhood. Now, a fatherhood was not only a, pro a father, was not only a progenitor, but also a protector and a provider Amen. for his for a what his wife and his children these were the uh the things that he was bringing to their lives uh, and 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 you know in order to give them to your family you need to possess them yourselves yourself you, you know you're not going to give purity to your children you're not going to pass that on unless you're modeling it unless you're living it unless they can see it in your gaze when you pass by that billboard by the side of the road that you know they need to see that your eyes are protected 
and preserved for only your wife, Amen. that your love, your heart, that these things are protected and preserved only for your wife and your kids can see it. They really can. Anyway, and, and the television. Not, I'm sorry. You know, and, and when you're watching TV, flipping the channel, you know. Um... Yeah, I agree. There's no TV in that world, but they still had to deal with it. I made a covenant and... with my eyes, David said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, 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 that this is the way the public world was in the Roman Empire. It was pornographic. Oh yeah. And so you, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, if you if you read uh, one of Cardinal Newman's novels, opens with this scene of a pagan festival and this Christian who's trying to protect his purity as he walks through a city street because of what was going on around him. It was so hard for him just to get from one place to another without his purity being assaulted. But we've got to protect it. Uh, that's what the fathers of the church were. They were fathers. They were fathers who took it upon themselves to protect the family, to provide for the family. Even when the world was waking up to find itself Arian, then Athanasius, whose icon I see over your shoulder, he was going to still be a father. And he was going to still stand for the church and protect his his flock. Uh, you see this, this love for the bride of Christ in these fathers. Mm -hmm. the, you see this desire to protect the purity of their children in the church, and it was a passion for them. You know, I, I remember riding my motorcycle, and uh, and, and you, you hear me talk about it in Long Wine Home Season 1, where the Lord just kept drilling into my head, head the words that you just spoke. What does a man pro procreate, protect, provide? But procreate is a big okay. deal. I was at the bank yeah. the other day signing some papers, in this, and I... I, I, I young man I liked. I go, so you're married? How many kids? Do you have any kids yet or plan? And he goes, no, we had a dog and found out how much responsibility that took. And, you know, I wanted to grab him again. You know how cool it is to get to bring an eternal being into existence and to, to participate with God like that. I mean, but how can you call yourself a man and not uh, want to be a father and not, not uh, to understand what it means to procreate, which God, the father yeah. did eternally yeah. begot his son. That's what love does. We're talking with Mike Aquilina. We're going to talk more about the manly early church fathers. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure with Bear Wozniak. Go to our website, deepadventure.com, and you can get uh, you can sign up for the, the man cave there, our, our private uh, secret Facebook group. You can only sign up for it at the website, deepadventure.com. We'll be right back. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. A friend of mine posted something on Facebook yesterday, Tom Clark. Love that guy. He's a surfer, an artist, just loves Jesus so much. And uh, he went to the islands last year for his first time, and now he's back again. And I'll get to, I get to leave for Hawaii in about a week. But he posted this story, which is almost totally parallels <clears throat> the story from one, from one of my books, The Deep, Deep Adventure of the Way of Heroic Virtue. I tell about every... 20 pages, I tell about a page and a half of one of the ocean rescues I did. And it's very similar to, to uh, several that I've done, uh, where you go to re make the rescue. With, there's a man and woman in trouble out on a surfboard, uh, and you go to make the rescue, and the man is too macho. He's, you know, and so what Tom was saying is he saw something happening on the North Shore of Oahu where someone was paddling out with his wife, um, didn't know what he was doing, went out too far, uh, Tom went over to the lifeguard tower. He could see they were already on it with the binoculars. They went out on a jet ski about of a quarter mile out or, or maybe more. I don't know how far. And um, the, the, the man refused help. Uh, the, they, they, and they took the woman in. It took him a half hour or so, and he finally got to shore. And I remember an ocean rescue where I went out, and they were in such big trouble, and they had no idea that they were in trouble. They happened to drift out in, through a channel in heavy surf, and, and they were paddling so fast uh, because the current was taking them out. They thought they were just, that this was just an easy thing to do. And I get out there, I went way out at least a half a mile to where they were. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it was a third of a mile, but quite a ways out b beyond the, the reef. And, um, I said, Hey, why don't you guys turn around and paddle in? You're kind of getting out a little bit far. And he goes, why? And I go, well, just turn around and try it. And she turned around her board and tried to paddle and realized she wasn't making any progress. She was drifting further out to sea. 
And he said, we don't need your help. And I go, um, grab onto my leash. And his wife did. And he did. And he said, and I told him basically, I'm not coming back for you. If you're going to, if this, this is your, this is your, this is your one chance. And, uh, finally his wife got him to hang on to, to, to her leash. And I was able to power him through and time the sets and get him through heavy surf and bring him in. It took almost 45 minutes to an hour to get him in. And as soon as he got close to the shore, the man broke away and went in by himself. And I brought the woman in. And this is, this is what I mean. Men, where are you leading your wives? You're taking them out into, 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 into conditions that are not good for either of you. And, and then you abandon them and want someone else to rescue them. And then when you need help, you won't even get it. You try to, and when you, when you do get help, you won't thank that person. You're too embarrassed for it. Men, where are you leading your families? Where are you leading your women? Are you going to be a macho man or are you going to get the help you need to clear yourself from your addictions, to get your priorities right, to lead by example, by being a man of prayer, a man who reads the word, a man who brings his, <coughs> his family to, to mass Make sure his kids go to catechism. Where are you leading your women? Where are you leading your family? Are, are you leading them out into, into hazardous reefs, or are you going to bring them, are you going to bring them uh, into the presence of the Lord? And so we're talking about, my, with Mac, Mike Aquilina, the difference between what it means to be a man versus a macho man being a limp-wristed wimp. You know, um, and he's using the early church fathers as an example. Mike, what's another? Uh, what, what's one of the other one of the early church fathers that's an example to us? You know, and I don't use the word masculine anymore because that's been stolen from us. You know, there's a million yeah. genders out there. They say now, I just get right to it and say the word manly, even though that's it, politically incorrect. What what are and what I, are some of the manly? Uh, what's another one of the manly fathers? Well, you know, I think the essence of manhood is fatherhood. Okay, and we exercise that in different ways. You know, some of us exercise it in a family by bringing children into the world, by raising those children up, by providing for them and protecting them. Others will do the same within the church. You know, that is one of the functions of celibacy, that it allows men to play a fatherly role in a parish, in their neighborhood, in uh, in their extended family. This is something that is... Uh, that that is that is willed by God, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, another figure uh, we mentioned, Athanasius. I'm also very fond of John Chrysostom, mm -hmm. and John was one of these wild men. He was a prodigy. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, you know, Ivy League as a mm -hmm. young man. He studied under the the best scholar of his time, Libanius, mm -hmm. who was a pagan. Mm -hmm. uh, John learned his chops as a, a rhetorician, as an orator, from. Libanius, the greatest in the world, the the trainer of emperors. Libanius was, and he yes. and John Libanius's greatest student. He thought he would. Libanius wanted Chrysostom to take his place when he when he retired. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know, this is this is it. He was training up his uh, his most gifted student here. But John had a different call, and John followed that call into the wilderness. He went up on Mount Silpius with the other solitaries, and he used to spend his nights reading the scriptures by firelight with his arms outstretched Amen. so he wouldn't fall asleep. Oh, my God. How beautiful. Why did he do that? So that he could commit the scriptures to memory. Yes. He wanted to memorize the scriptures. And so he would read the books of the Bible. He would fast and pray so that he would not only memorize them, but understand them in the light of the Spirit. John wanted to gain self-control. Well, in doing this, he went a little too wild. He... He really destroyed his health, uh, and the other solitaries said, you know what? you got to go back down to the city, and he resisted them as long as he could, but after a while, he had to go back down to the city where the bishop very soon recognized his gifts, ordained him a deacon. Later, he was ordained a priest. He became a bishop, and he became the bishop of the most important see in the east. Antioch, uh, the was it? Constantinople, Constantinople. okay. Constantinople. He was a uh, he was a priest in Antioch. He was brought to be the bishop of Constantinople, which was where the emperor was ruling. See, so the emperor had him kidnapped hmm. and brought to the capital. But here here's what I'm getting at. When he met, you know John in his early life, you know he went up on Mount Silpius and he did these wild things, but still they were mostly about John. He was preparing himself for something great. But he was turned inward. Mm. He was perfecting himself mm. with God's grace. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Then something happened. He found himself immersed in, in the parish. 
and he became immersed in the lives of his families. Mm. And there's this stunning line mm. in one of his homilies from that period. He says to his, his congregation, I know no other life but you. Oh, how beautiful. Salvation of your souls. How beautiful. And you know, I know when he was younger too, they, he had a friend, Basil. I don't think it was the, it's not Basil the Great, but another Basil. And he knew the, he knew the bishop was out to get them and, and try to ordain them as priests then. And he, his one friend, I think, got ordained, and he escaped to the mountains. So, you know, <laughs> the men out there, again, I want to say this to you, don't run and hide anymore. You have a mission and a purpose, and it's yes. not just, you know, it's not just so that you can make enough money so you can have a life of ease, have your, your black pickup truck, go fishing, watch football, and, and, and have fun with your buddies. You have a mission and a purpose, and stop running and hiding from it. You actually know what it is. God's already put on your heart a thing or people, situations that you know you can deal with. And one of the things I'm challenging men to is rise up and say, I want to, be, I want to become a catechist. I want to start teaching young people. I want to be involved more directly in the life of the church. And, um, and so it's like, yeah, it's like John Chrysostom. He, he hid out huh, in the caves up there in the mountains, but uh, eventually God drug him back down and, and, and launched him. So stop hiding under a rock and start serving the Lord. Uh, Mike, what's another, and, and, and going back to St. Athanasius too, I love him because he kept getting thrown out in the desert and coming back and getting thrown into exile and coming back, but he never stopped uh, taking care of his flock. What is another one of the church fathers that you just, that you see as a manly church father? You know, I think from very early on, the martyrs provided that kind of, that kind of, uh, example within the church of masculinity, you know, because they, they faced their uh, the, the the ultimate challenge, the challenge to their very lives, and you know it's our instinct. We have an animal instinct to avoid pain, and to turn toward pleasure. Uh, we want to uh, protect ourselves from death, and that's a healthy thing. All of these things are healthy, but we need to be able to uh, subject them to even higher things, the things of the spirit. And what the earliest martyrs teach us is. Uh, is, is how to subject everything to our desire for God. Mm. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch was mm. writing in 107 AD, and he's writing as he made his way from Antioch to Rome, where he knew he was going to be put to death. And all the way he's saying, you know, don't stand in the way of my martyrdom. He's, and he talks about a desire to go to God. He said, I hear this voice welling up within me like water and saying, come to the Father, come to the Father. Mm. And he knows that this is his vocation, to die for Christ mm. and to die as Christ. He mm. sees his, 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 his martyrdom as a Eucharistic self-offering. Uh, so he provided kind of a model from the earliest years of the church, and it was followed by many others. Just a, a you know a generation later, we have Justin Martyr, who says he was converted from paganism because he saw Christians go to their death with courage, and he had never seen right. such Right, and what he courage. meant by that is he was watching them in the Colosseum, right? I mean, Irenaeus, Irene, um, Ignatius ended up in uh, being torn apart by lions. We're, ta yes. we're talking with Mike Aquilina. We're going to try to get him a little bit more excited next time. I'm sorry it's been so boring this <laughs> This segment, we'll, we'll try to get him a little bit more animated. <laughs> Mike Aquilina, one of my favorite people in the world, love this man so much. You guys, uh, I, he probably is going to hate me saying this, but uh, get in touch with him and have him come out and speak for you. I know he's one of the bu busiest speakers there are, but what a, he's just a great speaker. And uh, and so, um, what what's your website, Mike, where they can find you? Fathersofthechurch.com. Of course, it is. Fathersofthechurch.com. <laughs> We'll be right back. You can visit us at the at deepadventure.com. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We've been talking with Mike Aquilina about what it means to be a man, uh, not a macho man and not a wimp, but what it means to be manly. Uh, and we're using the great examples of the early church fathers to explore that. And we were talking about uh, the, 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 the church father, Justin Martyr, when I read his, his uh, description of the epiclesis, uh, uh, you know, the, where the host is sanctified, when I saw him write that to the emperor, which meant he was probably going to be martyred but for writing it, and I go, oh my gosh, that's what I used to hear at Mass when I was a, you know, a kid. And I realized... The primitive church was a Catholic church, and that's that was kind of the the key that brought me brought me back. So 
What about this guy, Justin Martyr? Would you say he was manly? <laughs> he was, you know, and he proved it. He was a guy who made his way across the world. He, he, he uh, grew up in Samaria, okay, in the Holy Land, Palestine, and, uh, and he was a philosopher. Uh, he wore the distinctive garb of the philosopher, but he managed to wander across the, the empire until he got to Rome. Why? Because he was ambitious for the Lord. If he was going to practice philosophy, he wasn't going to do it out in the sticks. He was going to make the greatest philosophical school in the world, in the capital of the world, and he was going to just plant it there, and he was going to make disciples for the Lord in the way he knew how. And that was by philosophy. He was going to practice his trade for God, and he was going to use it as an effective means of defending the gospel and spreading the gospel. Justin was a remarkable guy, and he put everything he had at the disposal of the Lord. And so, and he was then he was eventually martyred. He was. He was. You know, he said that he had been inspired early on by the example of the martyrs. He had seen. While he was still a pagan, he had seen Christians go to their death and go courageously and even cheerfully. And that made such an impression on him that they had no no real fear of death. Okay, so you know, they feared other things more than they feared death. And and all those people that went to death, were they really smart like Justin Martyr and, 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 and they were philosophers and they were theologians? No. What does the word martyr mean? It means to be a witness. So you guys yes. are hiding under a rock saying your, your religion is a real personal thing. You need to spend a, a, at least a half hour longer every day in prayer, and you won't be able to stand it. You'll want to be a witness. You don't have to be the person on Catholic Answers to bring people to Christ. You need to be a witness of what he's done in your own life. And then, of course, go deeper with your understanding. But you don't need to be the world's expert philosopher. Justin Martyr was a witness. That's what martyr means. Yeah, And he was converted by ordinary simple folks. You bring up an excellent point there, that history doesn't turn just on the witness of intellectuals and celebrities and people who, who are in the media. Justin Martyr was an intellectual. He was a celebrity. He was an extraordinarily gifted guy, and he was in the media of his time. But I maintain that most of the growth of the church during that period uh, came about because of the witness of people whose names we will never know. Ordinary people doing ordinary jobs on ordinary streets in ordinary cities. You know, they were do just doing the thing that they do and making an impression on their next door neighbors. And then their next door or neighbors. Or the servants became. within the emperor's own household. That's brought right. Conversion and to. People, yeah. It wasn't the learned people who brought it to them, it was their own servants that brought them the. So what does it mean to be a witness? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's, it's, to, it's to live your faith and not be ashamed of your faith and, uh, and not put it aside for your convenience. That means that, you know, we don't give in and indulge in gossip. We don't give in and indulge in name calling because we think none of our Christian brothers are watching. God is always watching. The Blessed Virgin is always with us. We don't want to let them down. Mm. Okay. And, and we, we have to live consistently whether or not the people in our Bible study are watching. Mm. So we've got to live purity. We've got to live honesty. We've got to live charity. And we've got to live it all the time. People need to know. You know, if you're an accountant, people need to know that you're an honest accountant, that you won't cross those lines. Uh, and, um, you know, and no matter what we're doing, People have to know that we're doing it with honesty and integrity. And I believe that that's the way the early Christians and converted the world. One of the ways you do that is by paying your bills and, uh, you know, just yes. uh, treating people with justice. But to me, it all goes back again to uh, conversion, you know, spending time yeah. with the Lord. Uh, and you can't help. But, you know, I remember remember when my, my family, we all kind of came to a conversion experience uh, back in the while well, I was back in the 70s. It was a while ago. And at one point, my dad was praying and God says, I'm going to be a witness. And I, and he, he was thinking like, am I going to see a traffic accident? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, and I, and suddenly the Lord propelled him into a situation where he had a profound uh, impact on someone's life, uh, uh, a, a, as a witness to God's love and, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, God's uh, plan that we, he has for our lives, you know, his the adventure he has for us. And it was just kind of an unusual situation that happened. And, and so, if you ask the Lord, he will give you godly appointments. You will have your opportunities 
to share. And it, it happens just so naturally because you love God and you love people for the sake of God. Mike Aquilino, what's another early church father? We got like time for one more. You know, I'll go with a really obscure guy, a priest named Irenaeus of Sirmium, okay? So not the famous uh, one. No, no, no. This is just a, an obscure guy named Irenaeus. And he was someone who was put to death for being a Christian. And, uh, you know, he was tortured for a long time at the end. And he said something really interesting uh, when he was being tortured. He said, with my endurance, I am now offering sacrifice as I have always offered the sacrifice. Mm. So what he was doing there is what Ignatius of Antioch had done long before. He was oh. comparing his self-offering to the offering of the Mass. Oh, he said, amen. look, every day when I was in my parish, I was offering the sacrifice. Amen. What I'm doing now, even though I don't have bread and wine, even though I'm being tortured, I'm offering the sacrifice, that same sacrifice. Well, we should have that sense when we go to work every day, that this desk mm. where I mm. do my thing day after day is a holy altar. Mm -hmm. If we're working on an assembly line, this assembly line is a holy altar. Mm -hmm. If if we're if we're you know mechanics and we're you know working leaning over an engine day after day, hour after hour, that engine in that car is a holy altar. We're offering our work in union with the holy sacrifice of the mass, and it is a holy sacrifice. It's united with the holy sacrifice, and it's made holy by Jesus Christ. The church fathers knew this, and we got to come to know it too. It's so beautiful, and you, and you make that, uh, you, you can also do that in the smallest little things, like, yes. uh, you know, your, your wife or your child, you know, Honey, can I get you? Can I get you some more coffee, or can I get up and get you some water? Yeah. It's the littlest yeah. things that are that are that are uh, a tribute uh, it, it, that carries you to. It's little things that get you to the bigger things. You know, a life of service. Um, Wife, child, key words, and that's what set the early Christians apart from their pagan neighbors. They had a reverence for women and children. Women and children were non-persons under the mm -hmm. Roman law, mm -hmm. under the Greek law of that time. They were, they were not treated like adults. Children aren't adults, but women were not treated like adults. They couldn't give testimony in a court of law. Christians respected their women. They gave them vocational freedom. Same thing with their children. I'm going to give you time to do one more of the early, manly early church fathers. you got about a minute and a half. Ambrose of Milan. I love Ambrose. <laughs> Ambrose was great, and he was the Bishop of Milan, which was the administrative capital of the empire and an intellectual capital as well. Ambrose is the guy who inspired Augustine, St. Augustine, the greatest mind of his time, to become a Christian. Ambrose had the guts over his years as bishop to stare down three different emperors in different ways. Including them coming, in, the, coming right into the church. Oh, yeah. The military. Theodosius came, yeah, Theodosius... Well, uh, okay, that one, you know, uh, the, the empress, uh, the, the emperor's mother wanted to seize one of Ambrose's basilicas to use for Arian worship because she was an Arian Christian. And Ambrose occupied it and, and did civil disobedience, and they sang hymns. Ambrose and his, and his flock, they sang hymns while the soldiers were, were closing in, and the soldiers finally blinked. Uh. They could not bring themselves to finish the job. The Holy Spirit take... stood with them, They're, and their angels, and I believe Augustine's mother was in there too at the same time, right? Yes. These are yes, tough yes. dudes. And now, what is God asking you to do when you're sitting at a coffee break and they start speaking uh, uh, about women in a way that isn't, is not appropriate? What, is, what should you do? Are you just going to wimp out? I, I remember at one point in my life, I had to, my boss said, why don't you guys come to, uh, why don't you go to a coffee break with the rest of our team anymore? And I just said, well, frankly, I can't sit there and listen to the way you guys talk. And I wasn't being condemning. I just said it doesn't, I don't, you know, I, I said it in a way that wasn't confrontive, but I let him know how I felt. In fact, that's the days when the Lord told me, you're a walking man. I'll go walk. And that began my life of walking and praying during breaks and lunch hey. breaks. And hey. <laughs> I walked 10 miles the other day on the beach. But they changed the whole way. They, 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 the boss changed the way they communicated at the coffee breaks then. Mike, where can they, I know they can find you at, at fathersofthechurch.com. Right? Your website? Yes. And, um, yeah, that's my website. My books are there. And you'll find And there's only about 50 books, or how many are there now? It's in the 50s. I love your books. I love your books. I haven't got to read all of them, but 
I have a lot of them in my in my having red stack, and there's some in my got to get to stack. Mike Aquilino, one of my favorite guests that I have on my show. You're such a blessing to us. Uh, and he's challenged us to man up and uh, become real men, which means to procreate, protect, provide. Um, this is your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. You can find us at deepadventure.com. And uh, you can watch this. If you're listening to it on radio, you can actually go to YouTube and watch this show and see how, how good-looking Mike is. Actually, check out his library. His library is cool. <laughs> Till next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com.